Okay, so today I am here with my mom, Lee, who helped care for me during one of my psychotic episodes. So she has a lot of experience handling psychosis. So what do you have to say about that experience? Um, at the time that this was going on, um, Carolyn had come to live with me in Oak Harbor, Washington. And she was in kind of a really rugged state. She had just left a therapeutic program that she'd been in. And after she had lived with me for a while, we found her an apartment and she moved into town. And that began about two years where Carolyn was in psychosis and we didn't know mm -hmm. because she had a horrible psychiatrist, which we also didn't know for a long time. And he really messed up meds for her when she had arrived with a pretty good balance for herself. And it turned into, I had to be with her every day. Um, she, was going through episodes where she would do things that didn't make sense. They just were unlike her and she seemed very out of touch with reality. And, but we still didn't know what it was. And actually during that time, her sister Leslie came out uh, to help me actually. Yeah, and because I needed a lot of help. I yeah. needed like 24 seven care at that point. Yeah, and I mean, I was seeing a psychiatrist myself at the time and one of the things she said was, you need to take some days off. And, and so I would try to do that and Carolyn would open, would end up on my doorstep. <laughs> like, so, it just was the case that we were deeply involved in this time and at one point I was at a friend's house and I got a call from the police because they had picked her up. She was wandering on one of the main roads. She had a coat on, no shoes. Um, and this was actually something that we had seen before. Carolyn's modus operandi is to get into a bad place and then leave and just walk. Um, there are many times I had to track her down in a car. Uh, so she was kind of in that place during this time. And the fact that she wandered off didn't surprise me. And uh, we got her back home and it was just a long period of some destructiveness on her part, um, being in a weird place where she was saying things that didn't make sense. Um, at one point she decided that her devices, her computer, her phone, anything that connected with the internet was something that was watching her and she ultimately canceled all her social media, um, her Facebook, um, because there were people talking to her through the screens. And this finally led to a couple of incidents where she ended up in the hospital. And this was not the first time she'd been in the hospital, but this time, it was really serious. Nobody was not taking it seriously. Um, one of her emergency room visits put light on the fact that this psychiatrist was prescribing things for her in a way that didn't make sense. He like literally made me psychotic. Yeah. He's the direct cause of why I had that episode. Right. He and took me off of my antipsychotic and then put me on everything imaginable. Like he had me overloaded with really high doses of multiple medications, things I didn't even need. And I, at one point, told him, 
I don't consent to this anymore. Like I don't consent to taking this medication. And he turned to my mom and said, make her consent, which really fucked me up. So that guy was a quack. He was. So ultimately this led to taking her to the larger hospital on the mainland. We were living on an island and while she was there. Mom, hold on a second. Okay. So we got to the hospital, we checked Carolyn in, and in, in the first couple of days she was there, she didn't want to see Leslie and me, her sister. Um, I, didn't, and, I didn't know you guys were human, for one thing. <laughs> I know. I, I thought you were imposters. I thought you were like androids. I said that you were simulacrums which was a word I didn't know at the time, but I looked it up after psychosis, and it is a real word that means a simulation of a person. So that actually turned out to be true because that's exactly what I thought you were. Yeah. So after she'd been in for a couple days, she did, still didn't want to talk to us. And her new psychiatrist at the hospital who was trying very hard to respect her choice not to have any information come to us or be able to see her. And he kindly, at one point, manufactured a conversation where he didn't actually tell us directly, but he said, if somebody had this schizoaffective disorder, it might look like this. And it was exactly what had been going on with Carolyn. So now we knew it was schizoaffective disorder. After she'd been there, I wanna say about five days, then she agreed to see us. And uh, what I can say is it was a long trip back for her especially and for us because even though she was better, we still went through a long period where from time to time, she would just erupt or wander around. And well, I stayed psychotic for several months after that hospitalization. Yes. Like I, I know that every time I've come off of meds or gotten on meds, it takes like three or four months before the symptoms go away. That's right. Um, so, you know, it kind of like lightens the symptoms on the way down. Uh, but they're still there. You know, I, Leslie would tell me constantly, no, you're not demonically possessed, Carolyn. You're just psychotic. <laughs> and I'd think like, I wish I could believe you because that sounds better. <laughs> um, but I can't believe you. I can try to believe you and I can't believe you. And that's the crazy thing about delusions is even if you don't want to believe the delusion, it's not possible. So anyone telling you you're psychotic won't change anything like it won't get through to you and that's what happened to me and actually one of the things that i was grateful for in this process was during those two years that i was caring for carolyn and you know we were trying to figure out what was going on from time to time i would see a real glimpse of the real carolyn like I knew she was in there, but there was a lot of stuff in the way. And this is the stuff she's been working on now for years. And I have to say that I'm so pleased for her that she is in a good place. Her meds are well balanced, which is such an important that thing. That took years, mm -hmm. years to get on a stable dose of medication. Exactly. And yeah. and, and that's true. It, it, we were just talking about this a little while ago, it takes time mm -hmm. for the meds to build up in your system and really be supporting you. Yeah. And like the thing too, is that some medications work, but the medication side effects are so unbearable that you can't even be on them. And that sucks because pretty much every antipsychotic I've been on did work 
but all but like two of them gave me the worst side effects that I couldn't stay on the med. So that also makes it challenging because like medications that have worked for you and Leslie don't work on me at all. Like, you know, um, the one that you guys swear by as being like a lifesaver gave me the worst side effects of any medication I've been on. And I was like, this isn't fair. <laughs> You know? No, no. You're it works for right. them. Like, Leslie's my identical twin. Why does it work on her and not me, you know? Mirror twins. We're mirror twins. And yeah. actually, I should say, for those who may not have seen one of Carolyn's videos before, Leslie, her sister, and I are both bi bipolar. So yes. for a long time, we were all on some of the same meds. And what I'm really happy for Carolyn about is she's seen somebody here who's really good at what they do and who's really helped her a lot and the one who finally got her on this mix of medications that really works for her yeah and i don't know it's just so interesting to me that like schizoaffective is both a mood disorder and a psychotic disorder so we do have bipolar in common because I do have That's bipolar. Harder. I have bipolar, but I also have schizophrenia. And I'm the only one. I'm like, as far as I know, all the way back down our lineage, I'm the only one. <laughs> like, where did that come from? But I don't know, there's probably more to it that I just haven't learned about because bipolar isn't on the schizophrenia spectrum but schizoaffective is both. Right. So I wonder if that's how I got it, honestly. Because you've also speculated that my grandfather had bipolar. I think and so. And we can't know. He died before I was born, so we can't ask him. Right, <laughs> right. So it's all speculation because that was a time when mental illness wasn't really diagnosed. Well, and men didn't go yeah. to therapists, you know. Yeah. They didn't need that. Mom, I gotta say, do you have any, like, funny stories from when I was psychotic? I don't mind hearing about, like, the lighthearted stuff. I don't like hearing about the things I went through, but if you have any stories that are silly, I'd love to hear them. Well, there's the one when we went to the carnival in town. Oh, you probably don't remember. I don't you remember. may have been psychotic. They had, Carolyn had such a good time. I mean, they had a climbing wall and not long before that, she had been doing a lot of climbing. So she did that, I think twice that day and didn't want to go on any rides. That was fine. I think that was part of her overwhelming, you know, feelings. Because after a while, after we'd been there for a while, she was like, I'm done. <laughs> so we left. And then the one hard thing out of that day was when the fireworks started. And this was hard for Caroline, yeah. really hard. That's rough. But, but we had had a good time in the afternoon and it was actually a very good day. That's nice. Yeah. You know, one thing, um, about Leslie is like, Leslie kind of adopted the role of babysitter. Like that's how she describes it because she was also like, mom was my, I'd say primary caregiver. And then Leslie moved in with me to be like a secondary caregiver. And as she describes it, she was just a glorified babysitter. Cause all she did was hang out with me and keep me from wandering out of the apartment. So I'd start to leave and she'd be like, well, where are you going? Where are you going? And she'd like follow me to the <laughs> post office because it was like right across the street. And she'd be like, Carolyn, um, um, can, can I come with you? Can, can we go? Let's try going back this way. And she'd like rally me back home. And I remember there'd be times where, you know, we'd just be hanging out and it would be super fun. And it's like, she was really good at that, at like, just being my buddy during that and not treating me all that different. Although you've said that she was very impatient and frustrated, which I couldn't pick up on. Well, you know, for a caregiver in this situation, it was so hard because we didn't understand what was going on for a long time. Mm -hmm. And 
think one of the things about schizoaffective or schizophrenia is unless you know about it, you don't know what you're seeing. And it takes, in this case, it took a long time because of that horrible psychiatrist that she had. But even that, um, it was just a big question mark for years. And then when we finally got the right diagnosis, it was like, okay, yay, now we know what this is and we can deal with it. And, and we know now the ways we have to. Right. And um, the warning and signs and stuff like that, which we've since discovered with Leslie having bipolar, the similarities, especially with those symptoms. Yeah the grandiose delusions she would have because yeah. she has type 1 bipolar and it can be very similar oh yeah it's like psychosis light oh yeah Ma um mania is very similar very to similar psy psychosis like i've known people who've tried to refute that it's anything like it by saying you don't have hallucinations and delusions with mania and i'm like mm, mm, actually yeah, you know. She had a lot of delusions. You had a friend in one of the hospital programs who was type one. Sarah? Yeah. Oh, and I love her. I remember her talking with her dad one time and him saying, yeah, this is, again, same thing we have been going through, only different on the spectrum. Carolyn tended to be depressive. This friend was manic mm -hmm. and she would think, she could run out into traffic. And like everything she was would indestructible. Stop. Yeah, yeah. Like she couldn't be hurt. Right. Yeah. Like superhuman. Yeah. And at the time, I remember not being able to really understand that because that was before my first psychotic episode. Mm -hmm. And now I get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, I was, I've just kind of always wondered what I guess. I know you've already described it basically, but like your initial thoughts when that clicked, when it was like, oh, this is this is psychosis. Like not knowing anything about psychosis because we didn't know a damn thing when it all made sense. How did that like turn on in your brain? Well, first of all, once I knew it was um, schizo, I, started to do a lot of research mm -hmm. and that really helped like first knowing what it was and then being able to do a bunch of research and it it made it so much easier as we went along you know in the beginning after diagnosis carolyn was they put her on different meds which was good but as we said it takes time mm -hmm. to find the right combination so while we were working on getting that right combination, we were still, you know, um, staying on top of the various times that she would suddenly be quirky again, and obviously in psychosis. And at that point, it was easier to see what was going on. And for instance, there were a couple times that Leslie and I took her to the hospital because we knew she was in trouble, even though she didn't think so. And uh, oh, I was fine. I thought it was. <laughs> I thought I was totally normal. I know. I know. It's like all of you are so crazy. Yes. What is wrong with you guys? You're acting so crazy around me. <laughs> like I thought everyone was crazy, but me. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And that's another thing that I want to touch on is one of the major symptoms of psychosis is anosognosia. And the way I heard about it yesterday, which I really liked, is the part of your brain that knows that you're sick is the part that's sick. So with anosognosia, you lose any insight or like awareness of your mental state and you have absolutely no idea what's going on. Um, and so you've absolutely seen me like that. And I know mm -hmm. Leslie's tried to tell me like you're psychotic and I don't know. Um, I'm sure that has got to be frustrating. What, I guess, 
what is it like trying to work around that sort of struggle with someone who doesn't know they're sick? Um, you know, we, we spent time talking you into other things. <sighs> That's like, smart. Like I, I, I should talk about uh, an incident when Carolyn and I had gone to the hospital, to the emergency room to bring her for help. And um, because she wasn't in her right mind, she decided she did not want to stay in the emergency room. She had had it, she was gonna go away. And this happened frequently enough that I spent a lot of time like running after her and yeah. you know trying to catch her and bring her back. And this particular day, she went out of the emergency room two security guards saw her and kind of went in pursuit meanwhile i'm running out of the hospital and they tried to talk her in like like yeah. rationally right and which that, would never get through no and uh and so i took over and it's it's a way of talking that is gentle but firm you have to offer solutions why she should do what you need her to do. Um, and then also, I would take her arm or her hand and we would walk along. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because, oh, like one thing I stress a lot with loved ones who are helping someone through psychosis, like whether it's a family member or a partner, um, I stress a lot that probably the most important thing that helps is companionship because there's honestly not a lot you can do in no. that situation. There's pretty much very little that gets through to a person. It's so true. doing their laundry, cooking them meals because they won't remember to eat or mm -hmm. like my sister rallying me back into the house when I wander away or hanging out like supervising um, just offering emotional support, just being gentle, mm -hmm. being kind, but also firm mm -hmm. because they need structure. And these things go so far. And I know for me, those those are the things that have helped me the most is people mm -hmm. just treating me like a person. Because mm -hmm. a lot of people won't treat you like a person when you're psychotic. Like people would treat me like I was subhuman or an animal or something, the way they would talk to me or... Um, I think a lot of people don't realize that you're still there. Um, they tend to think that you're all symptoms. They forget there's a person involved. Mm -hmm. And so I will remember things that people did and it's like they genuinely didn't think I would remember. Like they genuinely didn't think that I would understand someday what had happened. And that really bothers me that there's this assumption that there's no person there who knows what's going on on some level because I can remember now the, the way people would treat me or mistreat me and I, I'm i a clear-headed person today. I know what happened. They wouldn't do that to me today, but they did that to me then because they didn't think I'd ever get to this point where I'd be a person again. Like, it's just mind-blowing to me the way people treat people in psychosis. Oh, and they treat you like, yeah, they like treat you like you're some sort of a threat or something, like you're a time bomb or something. Most people with psychosis are not actually violent. It's no, not... you were never... Okay, you threw a folding chair at me once. But... Oh! But, not typically, like, dangerous. Um, just... In a... Kind of like, in a bubble, you mm -hmm. know? Um, she was cut off from what we were doing and we were doing everything we could to pull her back, you know? It was kind of like leaving breadcrumbs for me and coaxing me to follow the breadcrumb trail. Like, here little ducky, here little ducky. <laughs> um, because, you know, I know that Leslie didn't really get it. Like, she kind of got it, but she also, would make these blunders 
and then have to like reel me back in when I'd freak out. Like she'd show me shows that were kind of violent or freaky or like mind fucks and it would upset me. And then she'd be like, oh, why are you upset? And she wouldn't know the source. And she'd kind of have to like call me and shush me and like break it by being like, let's go do something else instead. And then take me into the kitchen to, I don't know, make cookies or something. Um, she never really fully understand understood the kind of things that set me off but she was really good at calming me down and getting me through it by just like changing the environment changing the activity i forget why i mentioned any of that but i mean it seemed kind of pertinent well i think i mean just on a family level um you know you and leslie were hmm, sometimes with each other and i think that in that space at the time, in that scenario, there was frustration for both of you. And a lot of that, I felt, was sibling twin stuff. Oh, yeah. She would definitely treat me like I was her twin. Like, she, <laughs> so I don't know if she would just forget that I was not all there, but she would absolutely treat me like I was still the squabbling sibling and so i remember one day i now i don't know what time is when i'm psychotic so i don't know what's morning i don't really understand night because if it's dark out maybe it's like a daytime in hell and hell is just always dark like for instance and there was this one morning i guess it was early and i was playing music and it was really loud and she comes storming out of her room to be like turn down the goddamn music you're the worst roommate ever and then like slams the door and i remember thinking like oh my god i'm i'm a roommate i'm in a room <laughs> like in a room like it was it was kind of interesting yeah. that she was treating me like the way she would normally treat me which i always appreciated but I didn't know that it was even morning, so I didn't even realize that she was like in the same apartment as me. I mean, I, I didn't tend to think people were real until they were in front of me. And then yeah. I, did, I still didn't think they were real, but it was, there's a lot of object permanence that's involved where if it's not right in front of me, it's actually in a void. Um, and it doesn't exist until it comes back from the void. <laughs> oh, it's so weird. I have one thing I wanted to add, and I know Carolyn will agree with me. Um, at the time that Carolyn went through the great psychosis, um, I had a golden retriever dog. Aww. And there were some times I would stay at the apartment and I would have my dog Sam. And Carolyn loved to take him on walks and, you know, to the beach and everything. And I mention this because I really noticed that animals had a way of affecting her in a positive, like, response. Um, she sometimes felt the ha happiest and healthiest when they were hanging out together. So oh, Sam got me through that, like, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. We were tight. Like we had a really, oh, yeah. we had a really close bond. Mm -hmm. Like I taught him tricks. He knew one whole trick, and he was always so proud to show it off. <laughs> yeah. um, I taught him how to shake paw, and it got to the point where the second I'd walk through a room, he'd run right up to me, sit down, and put out his paw, and just expect me to shake it. And he was always so proud to shake mm -hmm. my hand. And so when I would take him on walks, I genuinely thought he was a person in a dog's body. And I th I thought that fun. I used to think that about people. I used to think that there was a special hospital where people went to to be turned into animals. And he was so he was like he was able to communicate with me like telepathically. And I would take him on these walks and I would tell him everything about my day and the comics I was reading and he would listen and I could tell he was listening, which he probably was. Um, I mean, I don't know how much he picked up on that, but um, I would alternate walking his route and then my route. So every other walk, he would choose the route and he chose the exact same route every single time without fail. And then I would take him on these winding routes where I'd make sure there were lots of smells or there'd be some different kind of terrain to like do different kind of 
climbing or something. Um, and and it was you guys it was had huge. Connected. Yeah, we See, were, that's we what were I saw. so tight. Mm -hmm. We were so tight, which is amazing because he was such a good dog. He was such a good dog. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's no longer with us. I have so many videos of him though. We were watching videos of him the yeah. other day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I feel like we might be winding to oh, this is a long video. So maybe we should start to wrap it up. So yeah. um, mom, do you have any uh, advice or insight you'd like to give anyone who is going through psychosis or has a loved one going through psychosis? I guess I would say like the most important thing is finding really good help professionals um, because as we've said we went through this long period with this psychiatrist who was not good and we didn't realize it for a very long time and she was on the wrong medication so what I think foremost is if somebody in your life is behaving in a way that just doesn't make sense and may even s seem harmful to their health, don't wait, like run <laughs> to a really good health professional because like happened for us, it can go on for a very long time. Oh yeah. And you know, for Carolyn, those are years that are basically gone for her um, because she was so not, in, related to real life. It was all a fantasy going on in her head. And I think the other thing is don't expect that things are going to get better just because you want it to or just because you think they're starting to make progress because this has been a long and ongoing journey for Carolyn. And I mean, there were things she couldn't even do that she loved, like her art and, you know, getting out, going places. We used to like to go to the paint or pottery shop. Oh, that was so hard for me. Oh, it's so sad to think about how hard that was. Oh my God. But we tried. We tried. And I think that's important too, is figure out what they can do and what they really like, like genuinely like, not pretend like, um, and just make sure you're doing those things. Like we used to go to an art shop too in town where they had little classes and things. and. We make greeting cards, you know. We yeah, make... you can still have fun. You can have a life when you're psychotic. I think it's great if you can still have any kind of fun because it's so scary. You yeah. deserve to have any moment of reprieve. And, yeah. and I think the maybe the last thing is, is not only support them yourself, but try to make it easier in their interactions in the world. Like one of the things that drives me crazy about mental health issues, we were just talking about this the other day, is people who think they know what you need and what medications you should be on. When or if you need to be on medications. At all. Um, and they tell you no. You don't need this. This led to like a last psychotic period where yeah. Carolyn's friends had told her to go off her meds. Like, you don't need this. And because she was psychotic, she was like, okay. And then went through like another five months of oh, yeah, renewed like psychosis. Months. So that was a rough one. That was a rough one. That one took like a year and a half to recover from because it really fucks up it gives you brain damage for one thing and then if it's that like severe of an episode it robs you of like everything like all your energy your thoughts your abilities to like read or write or talk oh, and it's unnecessary to have to go through that many episodes if you if you know how to treat it if you stay diligent like it doesn't have to get that bad and i make my videos in the hopes 
that no one has to go through what I went through and the people who do go through what I th go through are not out there alone um, because I don't want anyone to go through what I went through. It's really sad to think about. Well, I think that's all we have for today. Lovely. Oh, it was so fun, Mama. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I love you. That was fun. Yeah. Okay, so just to wrap up, I first of all want to say that I was involved in a podcast through NPR and it just came out on the 12th and it is about the cracks that people with severe mental illness fall through in the mental health care system in america and i was interviewed so if you'd like to hear any of my story you can check it out on any platform that does podcasts i listen to it on spotify um also, it's just an incredible topic. I've learned so much listening to it. Mm. I think it's worth checking out. Um, anyway, it's called Lost Patients. That's patients as in, you know, um, a medical patient. So I will put the link in my description box and you can check that out. Anyway, thank you so much for watching our video. I truly appreciate it. I'm sure you appreciate it. I do. Um, thank you, Mom, for being a guest today. That was really fun. I put out new videos every Monday and Thursday, so if you liked this one and you'd like to see more, you can stick around. There's more coming soon. Thank you so much, everyone. If you'd like to support my channel, please like, comment, and subscribe. And if you'd like to put in any suggestions for a fun video for the future, you can leave them in the comments section. So that's all I have for you. Thank you guys. Bye.